what I want to talk with you about today is I want to talk with you about bioinformatics, and in particular about high-throughput data, because that's what I play with every day. And in particular, this is a great time to be doing it, because we've got high-throughput biology. We've finally reached the point where we can make measurements at the DNA, the RNA, and the protein level, and we can measure all these things at once. We can get thousands of data points, and these supply, these assays supply tons of information. And this is great. And here's the word you knew was coming. Um, but when we start looking at data that is high dimensional, there is also a need to keep in mind the importance of simple tests in the sense of does what we are seeing make sense or is there some other potential explanation? The main reason that I'm going to emphasize this point is that quite frankly, our intuition about what makes sense in hundreds of dimensions sucks. We've tried it, trust me, the clinicians can't tell you, I can't tell you, so we need to be very careful. Now, what this has led to in some cases is because people are convinced of their results, they don't bother writing down all the steps, and occasionally they'll say, here's these great results, and as a result, if we're going to use them again, we have to figure out what was done. And this has led to a certain subfield of bioinformatics that I practice, um, which I have termed forensic bioinformatics. And this corresponds to basically starting with the raw data and the published results and inferring what the methods must have been to get from one to the other. So with this in mind, I'm going to walk through a few case studies today. And the case studies that I'm going to be talking about are going to be focused upon the analysis of proteomic spectra. Now, I want to tell you a bit definitionally about what are proteomic spectra. What am I talking about here? Well, all right, here's the central dogma. DNA makes RNA makes protein. One of the wonderful things here. And we've been talking, several, several of the talks at this conference have focused on expression arrays or methylation arrays. Many of these things are happening at the DNA level, the methyl group sitting on there, or the RNA, that's the transcription stuff. But in many cases, what we we're really interested in is what's going on at the protein level. Many of the proteins are drug targets or the things that we really want to go after. One, however, limitation has simply been, can we make the measurements on as global or as widespread a scale as we can for the others? For both DNA and RNA, one of the things that many of the array technologies have exploited is the technology of complementary base pairing. A goes with T, C goes with G, and proteins don't have that nice mapping. We have 20 amino acids that construct all of our proteins, and there is no natural complement to leucine. I don't know what goes with it. So as a result, making all these parallel measurements has been somewhat difficult. Now, as it happens, people have thought of ways to address this. And in particular, there is a technology, which I'm going to describe a bit more in a moment, known as mass spectrometry, which can be used to make measurements on tons of proteins. It can, give it, lots, lot, it can give us part of that, but it comes at a cost. And the cost is that we're going to see peaks, and the peaks are going to be there in the spectra, but the peaks are only going to say, there's a protein here of this mass. So it's not going to give us precise identity. We're going to lose something about precise identity, but we're going to gain the ability to measure hundreds of things. That's the trade-off. Now, when I talk about proteomic spectra, I'm going to be talking about mass spectrometry traces, derived from biological specimens. Now, this actually got people really excited uh, a number of years ago, and the main source of the excitement was the potential for using mass spectrometry to look for diagnostic signs of disease using not tumor samples, but rather blood samples or saliva samples or basically samples from biological materials that are easy to get. So that's a real source of excitement here. So with that as backdrop, how does mass spectrometry work? And I'm going to show you here this wonderful diagram of a maldi toff instrument, and I'm going to promise to tell you what that acronym means. So maldi toff the way that this works is that this process involves a certain magic substance known as matrix, and here's how, it's, how we're going to deal with it. We're going to go off, we're going to take a blood sample, we're going to stick it in a little vial, and we're going to shake it up a bit, and we're going to get the proteins in there, they're going to be suspended in solution, and then we want to measure them. So what are we going to do with these things? We're going to mix them with our magic matrix. Then we're going to take that mixture, and we're going to apply that mixture to a stainless steel plate, like this. 
At this point, we are going to exploit the first of three magic properties of the matrix. The first of these is simply that when it is exposed to air, the matrix is going to form a crystal. It's going to hold the protein in a fixed location. It's holding it there so that we can look at it more closely. Okay? Then we're going to take this stuff and we are going to stick it in the back of this instrument right here, pump things out so that we've got a nice vacuum thing. And now we want to actually get the proteins loose so that we can measure them. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use the camera to line things up on the spot. And to get things off of the spot, we are going to blast it with a laser. Okay? The laser is going to come in. It's going to hit this crystal. And at this point, we're going to exploit the second of the three properties of matrix. And the second property here is that because it has formed this crystal structure, most of the energy coming in from the laser goes into shaking the structure of the crystal apart as opposed to shaking the protein apart. It tends to leave the proteins mostly intact. That's property number two. Property number three is that has to do with the fact that most matrices that are currently used are slightly acidic. And what that means is that when the proteins or peptides break loose, the matrix is willing to donate a spare proton or two. Consequently, the proteins break loose, they're in gas phase, they're carrying an extra proton, so they've got a charge, and that charge is important because that's something we can grab hold of. So, we're going to take these charged peptides, we're going to apply a very strong electric field right here, and what that's going to do, in effect, is it's going to throw the protein down this long flight tube, at the end of which is a detector. And this detector fires really, really, really fast, and what it does is it says, in the immediately preceding, very short time interval, how many things hit me? It's recording intensity, number of hits, as a function of time, how long it took to get down the tube. Now, what governs how long it takes to get down the tube? Well, as it happens, turns out that heavier things take a longer time to get down, so mass is one thing. The other thing that governs it, however, is the number of charges. If we get more spare charges, there's a stronger force, and it gets thrown more. So we cannot, as it happens, differentiate mass and charge. As a side note, I can hear the music from over here, so is it possible to turn that down? That's live. Okay. In that case... I will just go with it, and we will, um, which is unfortunately bad for you. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll just work with that. So now, having told you all of this, now I'm going to explain this acronym. MALDI-TOF stands for Matrix Assisted, that's the magic matrix stuff, Laser Desorption and Ionization, blasting it with the laser to get the ions, and TOF stands for Time of Flight. So that's how all this works. Now, I want to emphasize that this is a physical process, an honest-to-God physical instrument. And to emphasize that point, I'm going to pass this around. I want you to get used to the idea that that thing can hold a, a number of samples and get you used to it. Now, one of the ways that you can gain some expertise or do things like this is that you can find some friendly biologist who's willing to let a statistician go over and try to take measurements, which is great fun for all involved if you don't actually have to make use of the data thus generated. Um, so we can do this, and this is actually what an instrument looks like. It's about six feet long, two meters long. It's slightly longer than I am tall. Most of that is the flight tube. There's the display screen up here. And if you actually want to take measurements, well, here's another of our statistical team. Here's the screen here. And this is really fun because you get to sit there with this little joystick and fire a laser. I mean, it's just, it's just like a video game. Um, and the other thing that emphasizes that this is a physical instrument this is a half-million-dollar piece of equipment. How do we know where the laser is going to hit? It's because somebody's taken a buck fifty magic marker and drawn an X on this display screen right here. That's where we know we're aiming. Okay, so that is how mass spectrometry works in general. Now, because I am a statistician by training, I also want to focus on what the data that we get from these types of measurements look like. So what I am showing you here is a spectrum generated by a mass spectrometry measurement. Now, you, are, you did hear correctly, I said a spectrum, even though you are seeing two curves. What's going on here is that down here, this is the spectrum as it comes off the machine. This is as a function of time, okay? Time, however, is not biologically inherently meaningful. What we can do, however, is from time, we can infer the mass to charge ratio. And actually, from many other things, we can make some guesses as to what the charge is. And from that, we can infer the mass of the protein. And that often is biologically interesting, because it can often tell us what it is. So we've got albumin at 66,000, hemoglobin down here, and a whole bunch of other smaller things that might be indicative of cancer down here. 
So that's what a spectrum looks like. The main reason that I'm showing you these two plots is to emphasize that there are, with this type of data, at least two natural scales on which to view the data for analysis. Okay. Now, when we are doing mass spectrometry, there are some other common steps that people go through. These amount to things like, okay, fractionating the samples. Well, if you start, try to look at all the proteins in blood, you'll run into a difficulty that there's a lot of different proteins. So if you generate the peaks, they, a lot of them just fall right on top of each other. So one thing that we might do is we might take this sample, and before we run it on the, on, on the mass spectrometer, we might run it through something like a pH gradient to extract just the fraction, just the proteins that have a pH between 4 and 5, and run those. It diminishes the complexity of the sample so that we can see a subset of the proteins more clearly. That's the goal. We can also do things like change the laser intensity. If you crank the laser up, you can blast loose heavier proteins and you can see them. However, when you crank the laser up that high, it also tends to create a lot of noise at the very low mass end, saturating things. So basically, again, crank changing the laser intensity is choosing a different subset of proteins that you're going to look at. All of these modifications here, and again, working with different matrices, different matrices cause different proteins to bind with different efficiencies. So all, all of these steps correspond to choosing the subset of proteins that you are going to look at. Okay? Now, with this in mind, there is a special case that came out a few years ago known as CELDI. This is another acronym, and what this stands for in this case is instead of matrix-assisted laser desorption and ionization, this is surface-enhanced laser desorption and ionization. And that means that we start with an aluminum strip like this, which has been pre-coated with a special coating that will cause only certain proteins to bind. So it's another way of pre-processing the data. And because this is fun, I'll pass this one around too. So. Okay. Now, these are supposedly really interesting and really easy machines to use, and here's where we start getting into the biological story. And this is a case study that came up a few years ago now. This is actually getting, well, 2002 even. And what happened was there was this paper that showed up in The Lancet, and what they said was, you know, we've figured out how to take mass spectrometry traces derived from serum samples and use those to construct patterns, biomarkers, that are indicative of the presence or absence of ovarian cancer. Now, this would be clinically a really big deal because ovarian cancer is at present a quite lethal disease because we essentially never catch it while it's small. The time we catch it is by the time it's grown large enough to cause distension and cause bad things, and basically we can't do too much then. So if we could have an early detection scheme that didn't involve opening up the abdomen and looking around, if we had something like a blood test, that would be great, and it could presumably reduce the lethality of the disease a good deal. So how'd they do this? Well, they started with spectra from 100 ovarian cancer patients and 100 healthy controls, and they also started with spectra from 16 patients with benign disease, ovarian cysts. So there's 216 spectra. They sp split these up, and they said, we're going to take half the cancer spectra and half the control spectra, 50 of each, and we're going to use those to build our model, to train our system. And then, having built our model, we are going to test it. We are going to predict the status of the ones we didn't yet use. And the reason I am standing here today talking about this is that their results were pretty darn good. Specifically, they called all 50 of the cancers cancer. They got them all right. For the controls, they said, 46 of these are controlled. They got those right. They got four of them wrong, but still, this is pretty good. What's even more exciting, actually, is the fact that for the benign disease, they said, you know what? These aren't cancer, but they're not normal either. Now, why is that exciting? The reason that's exciting is that, believe it or not, we actually do have some markers that are different between women with ovarian cancer and healthy controls. The problem is that most of these markers are associated with the fact that women with advanced ovarian cancer tend to be very sick people. They are not specific to the disease. However, the fact that this is splitting off benign disease in a different way suggests that the proteomic signature that they have found may be specific to ovarian cancer which would make this very useful. 
Okay, so they published this, great results, they posted the data, here's a sexy bit about it, large sample sizes using serum, which is easy to get, and of course, this created a great frou-frou. The authors got to go on the Today Show, they got to go testify before Congress. If you actually take a look at the 2003 U.S. budget, there's a line item saying the the NIH will support clinical proteomics, and this is a state of the uh, resolution of the House, and all these other wonderful things. But more importantly to me, I knew it was important because within two weeks of this paper appearing, we had about six different groups come to us in our bioinformatics cubby holes and say, we want to do this with our favorite types of cancer at MD Anderson. And, well, being nice, friendly bioinformaticians, we said, sure, we will be delighted to help you. But... They posted the data. Do you mind if we actually take a look at the data so that we can understand how this was done so that we can help you do it here? And things like that, okay? So we're going to take a look at the data. And you guys are lucky. The reason you guys are lucky is the fact that because this was important, we have not just the initial data set, but actually they decided to go back and do it again to get some degree of validation. So here's how it worked. The first data set that is posted on their website actually is, is from the initial experiment. It involves 216 samples. All of the spectra that are posted have been baseline subtracted, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. Just, just go with me for now. And all of these spectra were acquired using the H4 chip. That's a particular type of cell D chip, so that's a type of coating on the chip. Now, after they ran this experiment, Cyphergen, the company that makes the chip, said, you know, if what you're trying to do is get measurements from serum, that may not be the best coating to use. They suggested a different chip. So what they did was they took the same samples, they went back, they ran them all, again, the spectra that have been posted have been base baseline subtracted, but they used this different chip. And with this new data set, different chip, they again reported great results. Then, having done this, they said, okay, we'd also like to show that this extends beyond the samples we started with. So they got some new samples, 162 cancers, 91 controls. They ran them on the WCX2 chip again, and in this time, they didn't subtract the baseline, and again, they reported great results. Okay, so there's three data sets. The first two data sets use the same exact samples. The last two data sets use the same chip type, okay? So that's the commonalities. Now, for every single one of these, they report great results. For every single one of these, they also tell us a bit more. They say, spectra involve a lot of peaks, but if what you want to do is tell cancers from controls, you don't have to pay attention to the entire thing. We'll tell you somewhere between five and seven peaks for every set, and that's all you need to separate cancers from controls. Okay, fine. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try, with this data, to say, can we replicate these results, and can we check the consistency of the proteins found? Because amongst other things, they didn't tell us what proteins were involved in diagnosing ovarian cancer, and actually, we're somewhat curious. So, can we do this? Can we replicate the results? And we tried, and our first answer is, no, we can't. Um, problem is, we can't replicate their results for the first two data sets. Uh, actually, it's a bit more severe than that. It's not that we can't, it's that nobody can. Um, and the reason nobody can has to do with this issue of baseline subtraction, okay? See, Here's what spectra look like as they come off the machine. So you got a lot of these peaks, but also there's this rather low frequency broad trend. That's what's known as baseline, okay? And you can often estimate and subtract this thing. Ooh, there we go. All right, and that produces spectra like this. Now actually, estimating and removing baseline is generally a good idea. What's causing this in many cases is what's commonly known as matrix junk. Basically, when you blast this crystal, you get loose not just the proteins, but also fragments of the matrix itself, which are not so interesting. So we tend to estimate it and remove it ourselves. The problem is that when they came up with their signatures, they used these spectra without subtracting it. They then subtracted it, and they gave us these so that we could do it ourselves. Now, I'm a pretty good mathematician, but if you start with a set of data and then you remove some nonlinear function that's different for every single spectrum and you don't tell me what those functions are, I concede. I cannot reconstruct the raw data you started with. Can't be done. So we looked at that and we said, huh, well, that's distressing. But just because we can't use the data we provide, they provided to get their signature doesn't mean that we can't find structure of our own. 
We know that it's there. They've told us there's this separation thing. So maybe we can look at these data sets and find our own patterns that separate cancers from controls. Okay? So with that in mind, we decided to take a look at the data from the first data set, data set one, 216 spectra. And what I'm going to show you now is a heat map, the entire set of proteins for all 216 spectra. So, okay, here are the samples on the y-axis, cancers, normals, benign disease. On the x-axis is time, clock tick. The color indicates the intensity. Where the yellow is, those are cases where the big peaks are, and things like that. Blue means not too much showing up. And you can look at these things, and actually, let's see, I got a question here. We got some doctors in the audience, right? Any of them brave, brave enough to raise their hands right around now? <laughs> Aha! Ah, there's, the, there's the brave one in the back. Okay, see, I need some help with a statistical analysis question. So, yes, I am. Um, so, my statistical analysis question, which of these three groups is not like the other two? <laughs> Just big peak. I heard something. There. This one. The other peaks, yes. Indeed. The other group, if you look at the location of the biggest peaks... They're different. Now, okay, that's great. The problem is that, well, as I understand the biology, that's not where I would have expected to change because cancer is a big time screw up of cells. Things go long all over the place. And ovarian cysts, we just don't think are quite that different. So this is very strange. We expected the division to be here, not here. So, but maybe there's something unique about ovarian cysts. So the second data set, use the exact same samples. So maybe we can find something out about the biology of ovarian cysts by looking at that one and using both of them together to figure out what the proteins are and tell us something about the biology. So let's take a look at a heat map for the second data set so that we can figure out what's going on with ovarian cysts. So here's that heat map. We were not quite expecting this particular lack of separation here. <laughs> So we stared at this, and we stared at it, and we stared at it some more. And then we decided to try something that I unfortunately am going to recommend to all of the statisticians in the audience, and some of the doctors too, um, which is every once in a while when you see some stark separation in your data, be just a bit paranoid. And what that means here is we decided to plot both heat maps at once. Here's the first one. Here's the second. And I want you to take your eye. I want you to focus on this big peak, and I want you to track your eye upward. So what group do these others really belong to? See, there's this minor problem, and the minor problem is that they shifted chip types before they were done with the first experiment. So, can we tell the others apart from the cancers and controls? Yes, we can. Is it biologically meaningful that we can tell them apart? No, it's not. So that's a bit of a problem. Now, there is another challenge, and this one I'm going to pose to the biostatisticians. Um, for the biostatisticians in the audience, what does this type of pattern tell you about whether or not the run order of these samples was randomized? If you pick 16 samples out of 216, what's the chance they're all going to fall at the very end? Zero is close enough, yes. It involves lots and lots of zeros, so there's more, number, more numbers of that type. So basically, the data weren't randomized. So that's, that's a different problem. So, okay, so we're not too happy with the first two data sets, and there's some interesting problems here. But... They didn't give us two data sets. They gave us three. And the third one, they didn't subtract baseline. So what that means is that we can analyze, we can reproduce their results for data set three. So here's what we did. For data set three, they said, here are the seven peaks that you need to tell cancers from controls. So we said, okay, great. We went in, we extracted the intensities at those seven peaks for all the spectra. And what I'm showing you here are the pairwise Euclidean distances between all pairs of spectra. And it's showing a pattern that we want to see. Distances between cancers and cancers are small. Distances between normals and normals are small. Distances between cancers and normals are high. That's a perfect plaid pattern. That's exactly what we want to see. Great. But the second data set used the same chip type here, and it's looking at the same disease. So even though that one had this baseline subtraction bit, if the biology is consistent, we should be able to take the peaks that we found there and use them to separate this data, right? 
That seems like it should work. So how well separated do things get if we use the data set two peaks to separate the data set three data? Do you see the plaid pattern here? Hmm. Okay. We, 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 we didn't either, so that was a bit of a problem. So we said, okay, well, maybe they just got better over time. Maybe it's really the data set three peaks that we should be using. Can we look for those in the data set two data? Well, there they've done that baseline subtraction, but, but we can still maybe focus on one or two of the key peaks. So here's what we did. We took the single best peak for data set three. There's this one looking top down. It's really high in the cancers, low in the controls. Here's a side on view. We said, okay, that's pretty stark. And then we said, what does it look like in data set two? And you will notice that the color scheme gets a bit reversed. And that's unfortunately not an accident. And the peak has now become a valley that is surrounded by flatness. That's very strange. So what causes flatness? What's going on here? Well, as it happens, what's going on here is something associated with the mass of the peak that they're looking at. See, the range of masses, the range of peaks that they're looking at, goes up to 20,000 Daltons. They've cranked the laser high enough to get proteins that heavy. The problem is, on this instrument, if you crank the laser that high to get proteins that out, it tends to do bad things to the stability of the spectra below about, say, 1,000 Daltons. So we tend to discard it. What's going on here, the peak in question is at 435 Daltons. So it's in a range that's typically unstable. What's going on, the region for this flatness, that's because in the initial spectra, this part of the spectrum was saturated. It couldn't go any higher. And when you subtract it off, that's where it winds up. So we're not too delighted about using this peak. OK, fine. But so it doesn't seem to work going one way or going the other. Are there any peaks at all that can work for both data sets? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, and here's why. So here is this heat map of data set two again, looking at all the spectrum. And I've highlighted two of the best peaks. And I've blown them up here and here. And when I've done this blow up, I've picked these two peaks for two reasons. First off, they're really big. Hopefully, you can literally see them from the back of the room. Can you? Yes. OK. Um, the other thing, however, is that there's nothing else close by. If you see that peak, it's that protein and nothing else. The problem is, when you go from data set two to data set three, the peaks don't line up. The two data sets are systematically miscalibrated with respect to one another. So if you see an interesting peak in one data set and you try to find it in the other, you're actually looking for a different protein. So that makes it difficult. OK, so we're not going to try to go across data sets for the moment. We're just going to focus on data set three. That's the one where we can actually make measurements. So if we look at data set three, what more can we say? Well, actually, for data set three, there's something else we can try. You see, for data set three, they gave us this list of seven peaks. And they said, these are what you need to separate cancers from controls. And we tried that, and that worked. But they didn't tell us, are any of these peaks more important than any of the others? So we decided to try something simple, which is, for data set three, that's a bunch of cancers and a bunch of controls, what we can do is peak by peak, and there's about 15,000 in this data set, we can do peak by peak two sample t-tests and see which ones are really different. So this is a plot of all 15,000. And you will note that the magnitudes of some of these t-values are really big, like this one's minus 25 or more. And I'm sorry, I get excited if a t-value is bigger than 5. So 25 is just pretty darn big. So we then looked at the t-values of the seven peaks they report. Turns out one of them has a t-score that's bigger than 20, another has a t-score that's bigger than 10, and the remaining five have t-scores that are all small. So there is this question of, do we need all seven? Could we come up with a better test, a more parsimonious test, that just uses those two? So we decided to try that. And using those two, we achieve perfect separation of cancers from controls. We've got a better test. This is wonderful. But we then looked at the masses of the two peaks that achieved this perfect separation. 430, 460. So they're both in this range that we're not too excited about. So that made us disturbed. So we said, well, OK, we've got data set three. Maybe we can find some of our own. We found these by choosing ones that had big t scores. So OK, let's take a look at data set three at all of the peaks that have t values in, that are bigger than 10. And let's see if we can find another pair that achieves perfect separation. We know it can be done. 
is there another pair that does it? And we tried, and lo and behold, we found another pair that achieved perfect separation. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> then we looked at the masts. Now, 245 bothers us. 2.8. Cancers and controls differ in their ability to incorporate different isotopes of hydrogen. Um, no, that's not how it works. Um, see, actually, that 2.8, the calibration of the machine doesn't work. It doesn't extend down that far. That's extrapolating. Turns out that if you look at the spectra and you actually look at what's going on, there's something really interesting about that. You see, um, that's actually below zero. That's before anything has actually reached the detector. 2.8 is the electronic noise of the system. We can perfectly separate cancers from controls using the electronic noise. We shouldn't be able to do that. That's a bad sign. So this, act, this type of the fact that this separation exists suggests to us rather strongly that part of this separation is an artifact of how this experiment was run and not the biology of interest. We are not the only ones to have noticed this phenomenon, so here is a reference for that one. Now, as all this was going on, we communicated with the initial authors, and we said, um, by the way, you know that there are some potential problems with this data, and we would really like to see how you can use this clinically. And they said, oh, don't worry about that. that that's just low mass accuracy stuff. That's, those were just proof of, proof of principle experiments. And we were left going, um, what, what, what principle have you proved now? Um, okay. But there was this other comment, though, that low mass accuracy, that mass accuracy wasn't very good. Mass accuracy, what does that mean? Well, mass accuracy typically refers to how well defined or localized the peak is. How well do you know where it is? And that has to do with the calibration of the instrument. Now, when you get spectra from this instrument, the way the data arrives in your computer is as a text file with two columns. The first column involves m over z, the masses. The second column involves intensity. It says what's the height at that location. So what I'm showing you here are the first few entries in the m over z column for a spectrum taken from the first data set, one from the second, and one from the third. And I want you to look at these numbers, and I want you to notice two things about these numbers. First off, as you go from one group to the next to the next, they're all the same. The second thing is that the first number is negative. Um, we are not measuring antimatter. We're not that good, OK? So this is a result of trusting the calibration of the instrument just a bit too far. So that, of course, leads to a question of how is this instrument calibrated? Well, typically, here's the way we do it. Before we actually run the experiments of interest, we will start off with a mixture of four, three or four proteins whose identities we know, and we'll run those and nothing else, and we'll look and we'll see where the peaks show up. We know the masses because we know what the proteins are, and then we can fit the calibration curve, and the form of the calibration curve is mathematically fairly simple. It's a quadratic. So we can fit a quadratic with these points, and we've come up with the calibration curve. Now, that said, what does it say to you that the calibration or that the spectra that they're producing are using the same calibration over four months of time? It says that they're not tuning their instrument that frequently. I've used these instruments. They're not that stable. As a matter of fact, we sort of get unhappy if we don't tune these, the Seldy ones, once every week or so. But there's actually a bit more. You see, if you think about it, those m over z values, those are equally spaced in time. Those are equally spaced observations from a quadratic. And there's 15,000 of them per spectrum. Now, I already bragged that I'm a pretty good mathematician. Now, what that means from the statistical point of view is that if you give me 15,000 equally spaced observations from a quadratic, I can fit the parameters of that quadratic pretty darn well. So here is the form of the quadratic that Cyphergen uses, phrased in there's an A, T, naught, and B. Those are the three numbers they're looking for. And as it turns out, if you plug in these three parameter values, they will give you precisely the values they report. Now, I want you to notice this one right here. That's an exact zero. Who here has obtained an exact zero in doing a fit to real data? Okay, good. I'm not seeing hands. That's reassuring. So how did this happen? Well, actually, there's something rather odd about this set of parameters. The reason I guess these is that these are the default settings that ship with the software. So it's not that they haven't been calibrated in four months. These spectra that have been posted have never been calibrated at all. 
Um, so we think that there is a problem here. Now, I want to give you some context. In January of 2004, a company called CoreLogic went to the annual meeting of the Society for Gynecologic Oncologists, and at which point they passed around flyers advertising their soon-to-be-released diagnostic test called OvaCheck. You would send a serum, or your doctor would send a serum test off to their facility. They would run the spectrum checker, and they would come back with a prediction as to whether or not you had ovarian cancer. They were very proud of their estimated market and things like that. But this is all based upon the data that I've just shown you. We were not happy. Um, as a side note, for some of this, when we first heard of this, which was a bit before the SGO meeting, we tried sending um, our comments to The Lancet, which is where this stuff initially got published. Um, the Lancet's response was that, unfortunately, our letter, they thought, was too technical for their readership, so they didn't see the need to publish it. Um, so we, 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 we disagreed with this. So on January 29th, our critiques became available online, and this got eventually published in the journal Bioinformatics. Now, it's possible that a few other people thought it was important because on February 3rd, it was covered in the New York Times. And on February the 7th, the Society for Gynecologic Oncologists released a position statement saying, we think you may need to do a bit more testing before this is ready to go. And in later February and early March, the companies received nice polite letters from the FDA saying, would you please cease and desist with the advertising of this test until we have a chance to talk with you further. And over the next few months, there were one or two other comments and some other fly-by-night journals that show up every once in a while. Um, now, when we did this, so we wrote this and we said, this is probably a bad thing to use clinically. Um, there was, as you might guess, a response. And we were hoping that the response would be, oh, gosh, you're right, we'll do it better next time. Uh, but that wasn't quite the response we got. Um, so the response uh, from the initial authors was that basically um, we screwed up the analysis. We didn't do it right. Um, so how do they know that? Well, it actually turns out they point to two major criticisms. So here's the first major criticism. First one is that for those two data sets, data set two and data set three, where we said same chip, but we couldn't find anything consistent. Well, they pointed out that since we published that, um, another group had done just that. And they'd published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And since we'd only published in bioinformatics, theirs was obviously right, and we were obviously wrong. Um, so okay. Uh, and the second objection was still that you're just focusing on our low quality data. That's proof of principle. Our new data is state of the art. You're beating a dead horse. So, okay, we have two new data sets here. So first one, let's see. Can we find consistent structure in these two data sets? So we went to this paper in PNAS. We read through it. We, we noted that it had random field theory and it had wonderful equations and it looked mathematically truly formidable and it was wonderful. Um, we couldn't figure it out, but it had ma wonderful mathematics in it. Um, so we decided to do something moderately simple, which is they came up with a final list of 18 peaks. What they did was they took data set two, they split it in half, they trained on it, they said, okay, does it work on the other part of data set two? It did, and then they went to data set three and it said it still worked. Okay, so we took their 18 peaks and we said, how well does this separate cancers from controls in the data set? And this is why we were surprised, because a, a lot of the peaks are really low, and we still thought that there was this offset. So, but still, let's try the peaks. So this is a plot of the t-tests for the 18 peaks they report, and the t-values are indeed bigger in magnitude than 5, which is reasonable. That's how they chose them. So okay, that's reassuring. That's what it looks like on the second data set. Now they got it to work for both of them. So what do the t-tests look like for data set 3? Well, they're still big. But there's this minor difficulty that for 13 of the 18, the t-test has flipped sign. It's gone from positive to negative or vice versa. Now, what does a sign flip mean? Well, it means that in one group, it was higher in cancers than in controls, and in the other group, it's higher in controls than in cancers. We think this would be a difficult signature to use clinically. Um, so what's going on? Well, we decided to try it ourselves. Can we? figure out how the complex test works. So we went in and we said, all right, well, for data set two, we repeatedly split it into half, because we didn't know which half they'd use as training, and we tried refitting an algorithm using their 18 peaks, and every single time we get it, here's the number we got right. There's this really big spike at 162. The reason we got that many right for data set three, that's because we were calling every single sample cancer. 
If we said, by the way, let's just also pick the 18 peaks at random. We'll let ourselves do it. Well, that time, we got either here or here. This is where we call everything cancer. This is where we call everything control. So we don't get it to work. So we sent them an email and said, what the heck's going on? And they said, oh, whoops. <laughs> we made a coding bug. Um, so actually, what happened was they found their 18 peaks in data set two, and they built their model, and it predicted really well. And then they took these 18 peaks, and they went to data set three, and then, on data set three, they fit the best separating model they could get using the outcome data for data set three. You're typically not supposed to look at the outcome data in your test set. That's a bad idea. Um, so we looked at that and we said, OK, uh, we can see how that would achieve better than chance, but how come they achieved nearly perfect separation? Is there some real biology? Is there something that's really important here? Well. General principle, if something looks too good to be true, please try something that shouldn't work. So here's what we meant here, which is that data set three, we have empirically seen is pretty easy to classify. So the question is, is it really easy? So what we did was we went in and we said, we're going to pick sets of 18 peaks completely at random and see how well we can build models that separate the data. So here is what happened. So here's the plots. Here's what we got when we used their 18 peaks and our reseparations. Here's what happens when we tried to refit their model. And here's what happens when we try to refit it using 18 peaks randomly selected from the entire spectrum where we get to peak at the outcome data, or when we select them below 6,000 Daltons, which is where all their peaks were, or when we select them below 1,000 Daltons, which is where it's all entirely noise. Using peaks picked at random, we can achieve perfect separation. So this, again, is a bit of a problem. It's a problem because it suggests the difference is pervasive and it's not localized. So that really is a sign that this is, again, an artifact of the design, not something else. As a side note, this particular explanation, we sent this off to the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. And they sent us back a note saying, well, OK, it's a neat, it's a neat idea, but this isn't really a full paper. We'll accept a short comment, so can you, can you tone it down? So fine. So we cut it down, and we worked really hard to get it to one figure, and finally came out at three pages in length. And we were very proud that this three-page paper finally appeared, where it was accompanied by two five-page commentaries. Um, now, if they thought it was important enough to include that much explanation, weren't we good enough at writing to at least write some of it? Um, so we, 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 we were a bit confused. But OK, so that was one of their two objections. Here's the second one. Are we beating a dead horse? They've moved on to better data. So they've got Q-star data now. Q-star sounds really cool. And they've added some quality control steps to remove bad spectra. So they're just going to be looking at good ones now. They're still using patterns to separate good, and good ones. And, and the reported results are even better. And Terry alluded to this yesterday because the reported results at this point are 100% sensitivity and specificity. They can do it perfectly now, folks. That's a neat trick. Um, you may perhaps be remarking to yourselves, wait a minute, I haven't heard of this perfect sensitivity and specificity uh, ovarian cancer test, and that was a few years ago. What's going on? Um, well, let's, let's, let's look at that. So first off, what does Q-star data look like? Is it better? Well, here's what a typical cell-D spectrum looks like, and here's how the peaks are, and they're pretty wide, and here's what a Q-star spectrum looks like. So what you see in particular is that the peaks are a lot narrower. We know the mass is more precisely. Q-star data is better. I will concede that. Perfect, better data, fine. Okay, well, still, given that data, how well can we separate cancers from controls? Well, again, let's do t-tests. We like that. This time, lots of peaks again. Here's the biggest one, T value, around 28. So that should achieve pretty good separation. So what do we see when we look at that biggest peak? Well, here's a heat map. Here's the single biggest peak. It's high in almost all the cancers and almost none of the normals, so it's achieving near-perfect separation. That's wonderful. But if we look just a bit to the side, we see that there's this other peak that's high in the normals and in half the cancers. That's very strange. We don't really understand why it would be ha ha happening in only half the data. So we decided to look a bit more carefully at some of the other figures in the paper. And in particular, they told us about quality of spectra. So I want to show you some plots illustrating how good their spectra are. This plot shows the quality scores for all of the spectra they acquired during this experiment. 
Now, these are used different color-coded symbols. So the red dots are day one, the green squares are day two, and the blue triangles are day three. Does one of these three days look unlike the other two? <laughs> See, part of the problem is that they were running these spectra on a machine that was in the process of breaking down, and which in fact did break down completely on day four, which is noted in the supplementary information. Um, so we thought, okay, that might not be good, but okay, they know the good ones, so maybe we don't have to use all the spectra, maybe we just keep the good ones. So okay, actually they have a separate plot for this, they have a separate plot showing the quality scores of the ones they used. So here is a plot of the ones that they used, okay, they're all up at the top, but I, I, I've done something tricky here, I've, I've changed plotting symbols. Um, these blue triangles indicate that this sample was a control. The red squares indicate that the sample was a cancer. Now, I want to try an experiment here. I want you to look at this picture. I want you to fix your eyes on one of the dots, and I want you to fix, pick one of the dots near the top of the plot, okay? Your eyes there, are they fixed? Can you see that dot? Did it move? <laughs> Turns out that if you superimpose the two plots, guess what? All the controls, day one, all the cancers, day two, day three, on a machine. That's breaking down over time. <laughs> if you are given a time trend in the data, it is just barely possible that this will induce a pattern that is unrelated to the biology that will nonetheless separate the cancers from the controls. The subtle message here being, of course, that a better machine will not save you if your experimental design is poor. Everybody got that one? Good. Okay. Now, what's up with the data? Well, we asked them about this back in 2004 when we published this stuff about Selby, and in their rebuttal they said, well, if you just, if, if you just talked with us we would have told you that we produced it by randomly commingling cases and controls and we ran everything in a nice random order. Okay, fine. And then we wrote this note about QSTAR, and so in February of 2005, they said, well, if, if you had only told, talked with us, we would have told you that at this point, what we were trying to do was determine whether the between-day process variance was more or less than the variance between the case and control groups, and thus for this data set, case and control samples were run in separate batches on separate days and not commingled. Now, this is with respect to the same data set, folks. Now, as a side note, uh, we do think that this one is what actually happened, but as a general observation, if you really want to separate components of variance, complete confounding of the design is really not how you want to do it, okay? This is one of the very few cases where I can mathematically prove that this is the single worst design <laughs> for what they want to do. Okay. Now, are we ready for prime time? Are we ready to use spectra like this to tell a woman that it's time to get a new forectomy and have her ovaries removed? No, we are not. And later on in 2004, the FDA sent notes to CoreLogic telling them that actually, no, we're not going to approve your use of this because actually the computer software program that you're using is in our designation a medical device. And this ruling is important because it means it is subject to the regulations governing devices. This then was appealed and went on for two years in turn of which the FDA started issuing new guidance uh, to govern IVD MIAs, in vitro diagnostic multivariate index assays. Basically, microarrays, proteomics, anything that involves thousands of measurements, this is where they're saying, these are the hoops you need to jump through to get us to approve it. This one is still being negotiated with industry because industry is still not sure that they fully understand what the FDA wants. So are things better now? Well, this is what the New York Times paper looked like in February of 2004. So things have obviously gotten better. We've learned these lessons, right? Well, here's the New York Times from 2008. Wait a minute. Same author. He, he, he gets tired. He doesn't want to come up with new titles. Um, actually, in this case, uh, it's another ovarian cancer test. And, um, well, they, they, they did randomize run order of the samples. There's, there's just this problem that... Um, 
all of the ovarian cancer samples were acquired from women right before they went into surgery, and all the benign or the normal samples were acquired from women who were in for gynecologic exams. And it turns out that a lot of the proteins they were identifying were sort of stress proteins, and it seems that women going in for abdominal surgery to remove a tumor seem to be slightly more stressed than women going in for a gynecological exam. Odd enough how that happens. Um, so, okay, but there are still issues of choosing samples and choosing the design, because complete confounding can still cause problems. Now, quick show of hands. Who here thinks that these problems are unique to proteomics? Oh, come on, Terry, you did it before. <laughs> well, just because I can, I think, let, let's take a look at something with arrays. So here's a paper using microarray data to try to predict response to combination chemotherapies. This appeared in the Lancet Oncology in December of 2007. It was accompanied by a nice little editorial saying how wonderful this was. And one of the things that they proposed doing because of this was they said, let's look at two therapies, FEC, fluorouracil, epirubicin, and cyclophosphamide, or TET, taxotere, followed by epirubicin and taxotere, and see how well these engender response in women with ER-negative breast cancer. Well, they say, having looked at the data, if we would have used our signatures to allocate these patients to, pay, to treatment instead of doing it randomly, we would have improved the response rate from 44% to 70%. That's a big clinical benefit. That's why they got the editorial. Now, so we looked at this data and we said, okay, is it possible that there might be something else going on? So, we took the data and we checked pairwise correlations. And what I'm showing you here is a plot of where the correlations were really high. Now, I'm going to argue to you that in looking at this plot of correlations, that I see three clusters here. Are people willing to give me that one? I see some nods, so good, I'll go with those. Now, if we look at those three clusters, we can say, okay, what, what, what's going on with those? Well, as Rafa alluded to just the other day, these are AFI gene chips, and it turns out that in the header of every AFI file, there's this thing that involves the run date. When was the sample run? So what I've plotted here are the run dates of all the arrays that we've got. Down here on array date one, which corresponds to that first big block, all of these black circles, those are the spectra you see over there. The green squares, those were excluded from the analysis. By the way, all of these patients were treated with TET, one of these things. That's half of the patients treated with TET. The second block of runs, these are the other half of the patients treated with TET. The third block, right up there, those are all of the patients treated with FEC, where, by the way, these spectra were run on a different machine in a different lab. We have, yes and dear, complete confounding of the experimental design. So it's just barely possible that something other than biology is going on here. Now, is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because this and a few other mistakes underlie some clinical trials that are going on right now which we have objected to in rather blunt terms. I can tell you that story if you like, but that's not the story they asked about today. Um, so some bottom lines for you. All of this analysis and all these results, these, don't, these do not say that proteomic diagnostics can't work. No, no, no. They don't say array diagnostics can't work either. They do say that reproducibility and attention to basic experimental design or collecting the right samples is oddly enough still required even if we've got super sensitive assays. One of the things is that these tools, which are so sensitive, if they are sensitive enough to pick up subtle differences in mRNA levels, I guarantee you they are also sensitive enough to pick up differences in lots of reagents that you ordered for your lab. So since we know about these, and since we know to be aware of them, it is possible to use experimental designs that allow us to, if bat blocks are present, estimate and remove those effects and focus on the stuff we care about. So the fun thing is that since we're aware of it, we can avoid it. Now, if you're interested in reading more, um, well, you can read all these things. Even better, you can cite these things because that'll make me famous and my mom happy, so that'll be, ni that'll be nice and wonderful. Um, most of the proteomic stuff is down here. This stuff alludes to the clinical trials, so fun things there. So those are some reports. Those are in your handouts. And I also want to acknowledge some folks, in particular for the proteomic stuff. I really need to acknowledge Kevin Coombs and Jeff Morris, who are my co-authors at MD Anderson on pretty much all of this. And the other one that I really want to acknowledge is Sarah Edmondson. She's upstairs. She's my wife. So uh, if I don't acknowledge her, I'm in really big trouble. So I um, have done that. And then I need to do one more set of acknowledgments, which is to you, the kind audience, for being here on the very last day at the very last lecture. Thank you very much. Okay.